So we are heading to our second day of uh, revisiting the literary growth and development of literary criticism along with academia. So yesterday we had a wonderful session regarding the earlier uh, writers and the earlier works related to literary criticism and we went through all the uh, ways of literary criticism from Plato, right? So I hope you had a wonderful session, session yesterday and today we are going to start with the 20th century literary criticism. We are having our reputed and beloved erudite with us, Dr. Tommy John. He is a retired associate professor from SD College, Alapura. So I welcome our Tommy John to this uh, platform. And also, I welcome all the candidates who joined us for this webinar for this day. So we are sharing the community link in the chat itself. You can go for that, uh, for the notifications and all, okay? So while we start the session today, I hope everybody is ready for that. Uh, Tommy, sir, are you uh, comfortable? Shall we start the session? We can. Yes, yes sir. I'm ready. Okay, great, great. Happy to see you, sir. Thank so, you. Thank you, Matilda Alphonse. Audible. And good evening, scholars and friends. Today, I would I propose to start with the 20th century literary criticism. Yesterday, we had a wonderful session on uh, revisiting the growth and development of literary criticism. The first part was taken by Professor Nimisha. And today I would like to start from where, he, where she had stopped yesterday. The, my area of uh, focus, my focus area is new criticism. When we, whenever we think about the 20th century, 20th century literary scene along with its critical practices, the 20th century was witnessed a, a radical shift from whatever that went before in history. I hope you remember the famous uh, American physicist, uh, Thomas Kuhn, had made a, 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 an expression or he had coined an expression like paradigm shift. What kind of, whatever paradigm shift that had uh, been there in science and technology, maybe a corresponding kind of paradigm shift was affected in the cultural uh, scenario of the 20th century. We know that the 20th century began with the First World War, maybe after the, the, after the first decade, the First World War began. And immediately after the First World War, there was uh, there was an era of unrest. It was excruciating, excruciatingly painful for everyone involved. And the world which people saw before them was a world of uncertainties. New kind of philosophy came, new kind of artistic expressions came. We know that modernism came in this particular period. Modernism was not merely some, some what do you say, random experiments with uh, with the form of art or with the practices of creation. It was informed by, influenced by, it was affected by the cultural, uh, political uh, and social moral situations that existed in Europe at that particular time. The same case actually goes with criticism as well. You find that there is a radical shift in criticism or critical practices also. You find that the critical practices that were available to us until the end of the 19th century gave way to a new kind of criticism which is uh, significantly and very interestingly being referred to as the new criticism which uh, existed. Oh which existed in, uh, in the Western world on both sides of the Atlantic, both in England, in the continent, as well as on the other side, that is in America, at the same time. 
And therefore, this new criticism can be more accurately named as Anglo-American new criticism. This Anglo-American new criticism is a post-war, the first uh, post First World War literary critical theory. And it had its sway till the middle of the 20th century. Maybe, of course, we know that uh, the, the 40s and the 50s were the heyday of uh, lit, new, lit, new criticism in, uh, in Europe, in England, as well as in America. The influence of new criticism continued to exert itself uh, in the academic world until towards the end of the 20th century, until towards uh, 70s and 80s. And even now, even in the 21st century, we know that uh, in schools and uh, in undergraduate classes, you practice uh, uh, new critical tendencies. So I would like to, uh, to elaborate upon the major premises, the major writers, the major works of this new critical practice. And before I start with, uh, I would like to, uh, to remind you about some key factors regarding uh, critical practices. Very often, people think that literary critical practices are, uh, are, are coming one after the other. Just like uh, new, new fashion trends happen uh, in, in cultural world, new, new lit critical practices come. It, such kind of a view is not really uh, logically well-founded. I was interested uh, uh, to note an argument made by one of the major critics of the 20th century by name Ford Maddox Ford. He's not a major critic, but of course, he's a significant critic. Ford Maddox Ford made a very interesting observation about Western criticism in general. His idea is that there are only two fundamental trends in Western literary criticism. The two trends, he says, one is romanticism and the other is classicism. So it, it keeps coming one after the other. Of course, each time when it comes, it makes slightly, it is slightly modified in some way or the other. You start with so uh, uh, classicism and then it give, gives way to romantic tendencies and then once again, the classical tendencies come back. And uh, Ford also notices that the, there are certain kinds of pattern that can be seen even in the questions that literary criticism addresses. So, for example, uh, from the very time of Aristotle, from Plato, you find that the questions that were dealt in literary criticism were basically uh, dealing with what is literature? What is the function of literature? And what are the elements that go into the making of art? So these are the primary questions that come. How art is being formed? And of course, uh, the, cl the classical uh, literary critics and thinkers and philosophers have very clearly explained that uh, art is formed through a particular process called imitation or mimesis. That was a basic basis of art creation for them. When it comes to, uh, uh, let us say, the Romantic period, you find a radical shift. I, I, I'm talking about the proper uh, Romantic era, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, Shelley, Keats, that Romantic era. When it comes to the, the, the shift from classical period to the Romantic period is actually a fundamental a radical change. Some of you might have uh, heard about a book by name, book by uh, The Mirror and the Lamb. I hope you remember, you have heard about this book, The Mirror and the, and the, and the Lamb. The Mirror and the Lamb, actually the title itself uh, very clearly tells you what exactly are the major metaphors that you can find in defining the classicism and the shift to modernism or shift to romanticism? The mirror reflects. Similarly, the classical theory of art is actually a kind of reflection or imitation or representation, whatever you may call it. So if classical concept of art was reflection or imitation or, or, or represent, representation or uh, 
or, or refiguring uh, what is in the outside world, Romanticism was radically different, fundamentally different. Its very idea about artistic creation was, and, uh, was different. For example, they said about expression. So we use the word, uh, the, the mirror, to refer to imitation and the lamp. What does a lamp do? The lamp emanates light from it. Similarly, the Romantics were basically uh, uh, writers who, who, whose idea about artistic creation was that they were giving expression to their emotions and feelings. So on the one hand, there is uh, uh, reference to the external world. The art was referential as far as they were concerned. Art uh, al always uh, was a reflection of the world outside. Whereas for the, for the Romantics, art was not a reflection of the world outside, but rather it was the expression of a world inside. It is from the inside towards out, the expression of emotions and feelings. So these are the two fundamental tendencies that you could, you could find. Maybe by the time you reach uh, the Victorian period, Matthew Arnold, you will find that it is again going back to the classicist tendencies. They were talking about Again, morality, the function of art, the function of criticism, everything is oriented towards an ulterior purpose, to, to teach, to instruct, as uh, Aristotle had said. And by the time it reaches, uh, reaches the uh, end of the 19th century, you, will, you find a new set of writers coming up. It, it is where Nimisha stopped yesterday. That is with the aesthetic movement. The institutions, were once again coming back to a, a different kind of idea as far as literary criticism or literary creation is concerned. For them, the function of art does not go beyond the very, the very periphery of art. Art does not exist for anything else. Art is self-referential. Art is something that exists for itself. Art has to exist for its own sake, they said. And therefore, art is primarily an object of aesthetics. Is an organic aesthetic uh, entity in itself. So this kind of a, 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 of a shift we could uh, we can find from one one from one end of the uh, uh, one extreme to the other. The pendulum swings always. And now, uh, when when we speak about new criticism, we will have to take on from here. The new criticism does not happen. Uh, uh, what what shall I say? Uh, out of the blue. It has its roots in the back, uh, in, in, the, in, in history. So for example, uh, to some extent, uh, so let me, uh, excuse me. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the technical glitch. So let's think about the influence of uh, influences that made uh, new criticism possible. The first influence, as I have already said, is aestheticism of Walter Pater. The, the Victorian uh, decadence focused mainly on the text and did not bother about what it does outside the text. So this uh, primacy of the text and uh, the, the, the primacy of the aesthetic qualities of the text is an, is an idea which had uh, influenced the making of new critical practices in the 20th century. And the other major influence on new critical practice or new criticism is formalism, which uh, uh, emerged in the first decade of the, of the 20th century. So uh, formalism basically refers to the critical approaches that analyze, interpret, and evaluate the inherent features of a text. Again, apart from uh, the traditional practice of literary analysis, uh, uh, the formalists began to focus mainly on the basic idea that whatever that is intrinsic to the text is more important than anything else. That is why they, they analyzed and interpreted and evaluated a text on the inherent features of the text. 
As far as they, they, they were concerned, the form is uh, regarded as a defining feature of art as against the content. Earlier, uh, in the 19th century, whenever we speak about art, we used to speak about two major aspects. One is the, the form of the text and the other is the content of the text. And the content was always given primacy. The content was always considered more important. Whenever you speak about a poem, you always ask, what is the poem about? And not what it, in what form it is. But making a, a, a radical shift from the earlier stances, formalism focused more on the, the, the form of the text. They said what makes a literary work a literary work, what makes art art is not the content, but rather the form. And then uh, they say that uh, the artistic creation, for example, for maybe the, the romantics would say uh, that artist, uh, uh, the, the artist is, uh, is the eye among the blind, um, the, the, uh, the, 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 he's a philosopher, so look at those uh, those ideas which Wordsworth speaks about the, the, about the poet that the poet is the that poet is a superior being the poet is somebody who can uh, who wakes uh, keeps keeps awake keeps vigil when everyone else is is asleep but that kind of superiority of the artist that superior status of the artist the superior genius of the artist is being totally replaced by uh, or, or disregarded by the, by, by the formalist uh, critics. They say that nothing doing. There is no such genius that is at work. What is at work is basically technique. So they say there are certain kinds of literary devices that you are making use of. And they gave import and they say that this literariness, literariness actually refers to certain kind of devices that you make, that, that you use to make a literary work a literary work. So, for example, the features that make a literary work are, uh, are, are elements like sound, images, rhyme, rhythm, images, symbols, features, syntax, narrative devices, and all these kinds of things. It is these kind, the use of these that makes a literary work a literary work. Take, for example, a very, a very simple poem, like, um, let, what, what shall I say, uh, daffodils. So uh, if I begin to say a sentence like this, uh, I was uh, wandering one morning. I was wandering rather aimlessly, and uh, I happened to, find, to see a long line of uh, daffodil flowers on the side of a lake. If I, see, if I make a sentence like that, there's no poetry in it. It becomes poetry the moment I say that uh, I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills. Then all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils. It, it is not. It is no more a simple, simple wandering of an individual, because the, the individual wanders maybe lonely, not merely lonely, but rather lonely as a cloud. The idea of a cloud, the idea of loneliness, my wandering, and everything is being combined together. The sounds, the words, the images, the rhyme, uh, the, the figures, the syntax, everything actually coming together to make the second kind of expression, a poetic expression, rather, whereas the first one remains merely a prose statement. So uh, the, the formalists say that uh, what makes art is not the content but rather it's form. And now, <clears throat> whenever we, uh, we speak about uh, formalism, we uh, specifically speak about uh, Russian formalism, uh, which flourished uh, during the period of the Russian Revolution by around 1970. And some of the ideas put forward by, by major practitioners of Russian formalism, like Viktor Shalovsky, he had written a book by name, The Artist Technique, written in 1917. And another major figure of the Russian uh, formalism is Mikhail Bakhtin. So uh, Bakhtin is a very major, highly influential kind of uh, literary critic of the uh, uh, Russian formalism. He spoke about, uh, he spoke about uh, polyphony. Uh, in, in artistic creation about uh, Carnival, and there is a book by name, The Dialogic Imagination, written by Bakhtin in 1930. And of course, there is uh, the linguist and 
uh, Roman Jacobson, who had a tremendous influence on structuralism and linguistics, linguistic studies later on. So these people, so Shalosky, for, for example, uh, the, the, the title of his book is very significant because he says that art is not content, art is technique. And, and that's why he uh, names his book as art as technique. Art is nothing else. Art is not genius. Art is not inspiration. Art is not divine, uh, 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 let's say, spark that is given to a particular individual at the rarest moments. It is technique. So this deliberate use of uh, literariness uh, is what makes a work of art a work of art. That is. Uh, that is what these, these writers say. And now, uh, new criticism sprang from, with the in, uh, into life with the influence of uh, these, uh, these ideas. And that's why very often you speak about new criticism as a formalist literary criticism, or, or formalist school of literary criticism. You, you, you add the word formalist uh, along with new criticism just because it, uh, act, uh, 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 it actually was influenced by uh, the formalist school who focused on the text and nothing else. So coming back to the basic tenets of literary criti uh, new criticism, uh, uh, you, you find that new criticism appears as a reaction toward the biographical and traditional historical criticism, which was uh, uh, which focused on extra textual material, such as biography of the author and the historical background. So uh, if you examine literary criticism, up until the end of the 19th century, we see that in order to analyze a text, you needed to have two important aspects to take into consideration. One is the biography of the author, the experiences which the, the author uh, went through. So uh, the, the making of the man had a, had a lot to do with uh, uh, the meaning which he creates in his, in his work of art. And therefore, if you so when you when you study a poem by William Wordsworth, you take into consideration of the of the biography where he was born, where he studied, what are the influences on him, and all those things became so relevant for the interpretation, analysis, and understanding of the poem written by Wordsworth. And another, uh, this did not start with Romanticism, uh, mind you. You, you remember uh, the the book written by Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson's types of poets is very significant in the sense that so why, why did he write a biography? It was not merely writing a biography, but rather the uh, the lives of the poets actually shed a lot of light into the understanding of their poems. That is why he wrote uh, these biographies of poets, not merely as a, as an exercise of writing biographies, but it was a literary exercise because uh, uh, the the lives of the poets were very important in understanding the poems written by them. So this practice of, let's say, an understanding and appreciating and evaluating and judging a poem or, or a work of art uh, with the help of uh, the biographical details was a practice that was uh, done in, in England for quite a long time. And another or other major uh, aspect that you to take into consideration when you are uh, or, uh, when you when you are analyzing a text is a historical background. Historical background. Excuse me. Uh, did, did somebody say something? Uh, okay. Uh, the historical, uh, this particular uh, t uh, tendency of taking in the historical material or historical details into consideration is being termed now as the traditional historical or the old historicism. So the old historicism is named old historicism because we have now what you call a, a new historicism, right? The new historicism that started with uh, Stephen Greenblatt. Uh, remember the, the book Renaissance of Renaissance Self-Fashioning from Moore to I mean, Thomas Moore uh, to Shakespeare written in 1980. New historicism, uh, which, uh, which was advocated by Michel Foucault. So this, uh, as against the new historicism, uh, you find there was an old historicism, which was prevalent in the uh, un until the end of the 19th century. So what is the difference between the old historicism and the new historicism? The old historicism, uh, in old historicism, history served as a background. 
Sec uh, history was important, but history was of secondary importance in analyzing or understanding the meaning of a text. When you're applying uh, the, the historical development uh, of a particular period or the, his uh, the historical events of a particular period, that understanding of historical uh, uh, references will make uh, will help you understand the poem better. M maybe to cite a, a simple example, uh, uh, again, uh, <laughs> I am tempted to quote uh, uh, Daffodils by William Wordsworth. So uh, at what time was Daffodils written? Daffodils was written uh, when industrial revolution was entering into a new phase. And why, why did uh, uh, Wordsworth write about the Daffodils at all? Of course, we know that it, is, it was about, let's say, uh, ordinary, familiar, uh, everyday kind of sites. But along with that, we also know that uh, in, in England, which was, uh, in England at that time was called uh, the workshop of the world. And England uh, becoming more and more uh, industrialized. England, the English society and English economy was shifting from an agrarian society to an industrialized society. Places that were once upon a time uh, fields of cultivation slowly turned into uh, industrial townships. The sights and sounds that you that you were familiar in, in, on an everyday basis were soon disappearing. Daffodil was a is, is a common flower, a wayside flower which you could find on almost on an everyday basis everywhere, but such sites were disappearing fast, and. When Wordsworth chooses to write about daffodils, he is not merely writing about an ordinary site, but he also is problematizing maybe the disappearance of ordinary sites, familiar sites, the disappearance of, let's say, an agrarian society. So if you want to, to make an interpretation of a poem like that, you will have to take history into consideration. So only informed by historical incidents and historical developments and historical events and happenings that you can understand uh, a, a, a poem um, by, by any poet for that matter. So uh, now uh, let me speak about who are the major, so uh, we, we spoke about uh, two things already, the influences. Is, uh, uh, movement on the one hand, formalism on the other, and now, uh, and we also said that uh, uh, it was a reaction against the old uh, critical practices. And now, let's say the, who are the major critics? And uh, I would like to speak about the the pioneers of literary of, uh, of new criticism, and I'd mention three literary critics: T. S. Eliot and I. O. Richards. In England and John Crow Ransom, John Crow Ransom on the other side of the Atlantic, that is in America. Surprisingly, John Crow Ransom's book, The New Criticism, published in 1941. So it is from the title of that particular book that the movement was named, even though the movement or the, the tendencies or, or, or certain kinds of critical practices started as early as 1919 and 1920. So it became a larger, wider movement of academic and literary uh, or, or critical importance uh, by 1940s and 50s and continued to be there till 1970s. But the influences started and the pioneering authors started writing maybe from 1920s onwards or the, the late uh, 19s. OK, so the first one is T.S. Eliot. Of course, to consider T.S. Eliot as a as merely a, 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 a new critic is erroneous, I would say. Some of his ideas prompted a, a new line of thinking, for sure. But he is not an entirely, uh, uh, let's say, uh, new critical, uh, a practitioner of new criticism. And now, uh, let's, th uh, so since this particular um, uh, lecture is meant for um, students who are preparing for the UGC net. Uh, I, I would like to, maybe th this is a juncture that I would like to talk something about uh, T.S. Eliot, but not specifically in connection with new criticism as such. Of course, uh, 
Now, uh, if you take uh, Eliot's critical works, you will find that the critical works fall into two categories. Eliot's, of course, I, I'm not considering uh, his literary uh, creations. Of course, he's a literary critic. He was a dramatist. Of course, uh, you, you're familiar. And, and uh, about uh, with the worst plays that he uh, actually brought back into, into English literature. So the family reunion, um, murder in the cathedral, cocktail party, and, and, and those kinds of books. Of course, he was a major dramatist and very significant influential critic. And also, maybe the most prominent uh, writer, poet of his times. Of course, he's, uh, uh, let's say, the harbinger of uh, modernism or the modernist movement. People say that uh, modernism in English literature was inaugurated with the, uh, with the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. So uh, uh, as, as a creative writer, uh, uh, his influence is so great. And uh, to consider Eliot as a critic is to consider that he's a practicing critic. A practicing critic in the sense that so he he, he is a practitioner of poetry and he's a poet on the one hand and writes about the workings of poetry on the other that is about the, the critiquing on on, on on the process of poet or writing poetry so that's why you, you call him a, a practicing poet okay let's let's come back so his works fall into two categories one uh, one set of essays and books fall on uh, uh, is about on nature of uh, nature and function of criticism. It's about criticism. Okay, making giving some kind of a theoretical uh, framework uh, regarding how criticism has to go about, how criticism has to function itself. So we have uh, the the first major collection of essays uh, called uh, the Sacred Wood, published in 1920. Uh, uh, the, the the essay uh, tradition and individual talent that we you that we very often speak about uh, is included in this particular collect, collection in sacred wood even though uh, we know that tradition and individual talent was published almost one year prior to this it was uh, published in a magazine called the egoist in 1919 and later in book form it came out uh, in uh, in sacred wood in 1920 and then uh, uh, there is uh, selected essays published in 1932 so these essays were actually written by uh, 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 written by T. S. Eliot over a period uh, from uh, 1917 to uh, uh, 1932. So uh, it, it is not uh, not all the essays were written in the same year. It's, uh, maybe some of the most significant uh, essays uh, written by Eliot is included in this particular collection. So, for example, uh, the uh, the essay Poetry and Drama. Another essay, Function of Criticism, and the very famous uh, essay, The English Metaphysical Poets, and another uh, major piece, Frontiers of Criticism. So these, these, these essays are included in this collection, uh, selected essays in 1932. And then, of course, the use of poetry and the use of criticism in 1933, After Strange Gods in 1934, Essays Ancient and Modern in 1936, The Idea of a Christian Society in 1939, Notes Towards the Definition of Culture, which is considered to be a seminal work, uh, published in 1941. So uh, these works are on the uh, uh, on nature and uh, of, of literary criticism. And now Eliot also had uh, written on individual authors. So, for example, a book, uh, Homage to John Dryden, written in 1924, and again, rather controversial articles, uh, Milton 1 and Milton 2. Uh, so, Mil uh, uh, Eliot's uh, ra rather severe, unkind attack on, on Milton uh, came uh, 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 in these uh, essays, Milton 1 and Milton 2. Uh, uh, he did not regard Milton uh, in high esteem, uh, like many other critics of his times. Okay, anyway, uh, these are the major works by uh, T.S. Eliot. Now, let's just also uh, glimpse through uh, some of the major concepts of T.S. Eliot. Of course, everyone talks about this theory of impersonality. Uh, 
the theory of impersonal uh, and then another uh, major concept the dissociation of sensibility and uh, and uh, objective correlative well uh, i don't know uh, if i have time enough but still uh, uh, i think i will i like to spend a few minutes on theory of impersonality uh, of course everyone knows that this uh, this idea appeared for the first time uh, in his yes a traditional individual talent published in 1919 in book form in 1920 as we have already said so the traditional individual talent uh, speaks about three major ideas one is about tradition and secondly about the relationship between the, tra the tradition and the individual poet and third how poetry has to be assessed the scientific judgment the absolutely objective judgment that has to be made on poetry so in the in the uh, in the introductory part of uh, uh, the essay he makes a very uh, 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 what do you call a very interesting statement the statement is something like this uh, honest criticism and sensitive appreciation should be directed not against the poet but against the poem so uh, so appreciation has to be directed not against the poet but against the poetry itself it is the poetry that has to be focused on and not the poet so just like the formalists were trying to focus on the text eliot is actually speaking about let's say the poem and not the poet because he is actually talking about the relationship between uh, the poet and uh, 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 and, uh, and the poem that he is writing. So he begins the essay with the, the, the concept about tradition, and, um, and rather in, in his uh, characteristic manner says that the word tradition uh, uh, is used in English criticism rather uh, uh, in, in a negative uh, connotation. It is it's used as a, as a phrase of censure rather than a phrase of appreciation. You don't use the word tradition in order to appreciate a work of art. Or to, if at all you use it, you use it in the context of, let's say, uh, his archaeological reconstruction. Only in that sense that you use it in an approbative, in a, uh, in a positive connot connotation. In all other contexts, you use the word tradition to say that such and such a person is traditional, to say that, that such and such a poem is traditional poem is a negative, it's a, it's a, it's a word of censure. And then he, say, uh, he goes on to say that, but if we, but this is a kind of, he says this is a prejudice. To say that uh, a, a poet is traditional, uh, uh, or to, uh, to consider a poet's traditionality as a, as a negative trait is a prejudice, according to, uh, to Eliot. So he says that if you approach uh, without this prejudice, you'll find that uh, the most representative aspect of a poet's work of art are, let's say, traditional, in the sense that are the, those elements in which he asserted, let's say, his predecessors. The, the works of the dead poets most uh, 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 most emphatically. So uh, what he is trying to say that uh, uh, a poet becomes uh, significant not because he is different from others, but rather because he conforms to certain kind of certain patterns that were already existing. That that he conforms to the to the tradition. But if you understand the word tradition. Uh, as merely a repetition of the past, this is not what he means. He very clearly says that. Uh, for him, tradition does not mean a mere, uh, let's say, a, a, a repetition of what, what already, or the success formula of the previous generation, or previous writers, or the dead writers. So he's trying to explain what tradition means. He says that tradition involves a historical sense, he says. So uh, he specifically says it is not a knowledge of history, but rather a historical sense. A historical sense, not only of the pastness of the past, but also of its presence. So whatever that happened in the past holds, had, a, uh, 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 had a pastness about it. It happened at some point in time. It happened to some individuals. It happened at such a, uh, to some place. And that is the referentiality of that particular event in the past. It has a pastness about it. But 
if you go to the essence of that particular event you also know that whatever happened in the past also has some kind of an effect in the present there is some something that is in that actually goes on into the present that is why he says the past not only the pastness of the past but also the presence the presence of the past the past is not something that that uh, that has gone behind once and for all it is something that you that is being carried over carried along along with you so that kind of uh, so a, a person who continues to be a poet even after the age of 25 of course that is Eliot's tongue-in-cheek expression it is, it is true that people when they are young tend to write poetry but if you if you take poet writing poetry as your profession as, as your calling as your vocation as your uh, as your calling in life then you will have to take your poetic career seriously for such a person this historical sense is essential and this historical sense will compel you to write not not with your own generation in your bones but with with, with the feeling and with the awareness with the with the responsibility that you form a link with the great masters of the past that you are not standing in isolation that you you are actually being linked with them you are a you, you are you are, you, you are a link in the chain and that is why uh, uh, you, you will have to understand that you, uh, uh, you as an individual is not important. That you will have to succumb yourself to something larger than yourself. That is the tradition, the great tradition to which you are merely a part. So uh, Eliot is slowly driving at the fact that the individual is not important. And maybe that idea is brought forward in the next line, in the, in the next section of the poem, where he says that what the individual gives expression is not merely not he's not just giving expression to his personal emotions and feelings it is not merely what do you call uh, the, the expression of the personality Eliot's theory of impersonality is by and large is a vehement criticism against the Wordsworthian criticism of art criticism of uh, Wordsworthian concept of poetry Wordsworth's famous definition of uh, of of poetry as a spontaneous overflow of, of, of powerful feelings or Wordsworth's uh, definition of poetry as uh, uh, e emotions recollected in tranquility. So these these statements are being brutally criticized by by Eliot, saying that they are baseless and that and inconsistent with the real practice of of literature. So what he says is that there is, it, the poet is not trying to express his personality. Poet uh, poet uh, uh, he gave, makes a distinction. Uh, uh, in 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 the poet, his, uh, he says that there is a there are two personalities, there are two persons in the poet. One is the man who suffers, and the other is the artist who creates. The man, the individual, he goes through several experiences: bitter, happy, uh, exciting, and uh, horrific. So, various kinds of let's say, experiences are there in the life of the man. He he's the one who suffers all this, but the man who creates is, is a different person altogether, different personality, different entity altogether. Whatever that was important to the man who suffered is not may not necessarily be important to the poet when he creates it. He picks and chooses. He says that uh, uh, as far as the poet, uh, in, in, a, in a good poem, the poet remains rather inert. The poet keeps himself back. He lets the relevant, the appropriate emotions to combine. And that is why he uses this uh, the famous let's say uh, 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 the metaphor or, or the imagery of the uh, of the gases in the uh, uh, let's say uh, sulfur and carbon dioxide that uh, two gases uh, infused into a, a chamber in the presence of a catalyst. So uh, uh, without the cat the presence of the catalyst, the two gases cannot combine. But even if the uh, 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 the catalyst is present, the final product does not find a trait of the or, or a trace of platinum at all. Similarly, the writer, the individual, the person, person need not find a place in the final act, in the in the final product. What is important to him as a person, what he personally suffered, need not necessarily be there. What is what is to be there in the poem is uh, so uh, he he uh, he must uh, make himself. He must negate himself. So it is a kind of uh, self-negation, self-abnegation, and giving prominence to the, the, the artistic process 
the objective artistic process where he gives a free reign for emotions and feelings to to combine in whatever ways it it it, it may take so where the individual it is not a person so that's why he he, he succinctly puts it that it is a, the poetry is not a turning loose of emotions poet does not have a personality to express it is not an expression of personality but rather an escape from the personality so uh, so this is fundamentally the the idea of uh, the theory of impersonality and of course uh, uh, you are you are familiar with uh, dissociation of self maybe this this idea of the impers uh, theory of impersonality is very relevant to new criticism because uh, here the poet and the poet's personality the poet's personal feelings uh, or the, the biographical uh, uh, circumstances which actually made the poet experience such and such and such a kind of thing need not find a place in, in practically analyzing or judging or evaluating a, a literary work. Okay, now, of course, I, I don't, I don't, I, I would not want to devote much time on dissociation of sense. Of course, you know, uh, dissociation of sensibility is an idea that uh, you come across uh in uh, Eliot's essay the meta the english metaphysical poets which we have already said uh, appears in uh, the selected po essays in 1932. <clears throat> well uh the idea about sensibility Eliot considers sensibility as a uh, as a synthetic uh force synthesis something that can combine elements together so uh, uh, Eliot is of the view that the human person or the human uh, individual has two major faculties called the intellect and the emotion, which are the two major faculties. And uh, sensibility uh, is that particular faculty or ability of an individual to synthesize these two things together. What he says is that uh, uh, in, in true art or in, in, in higher art or in real literature, what you find is a, a perfect blending and a coalescence of, let's say, the intellect and the emotion together. There's a perfect blend of these two elements. And you will find such unification of the intellect and the emotional aspects in, in, in the works of the metaphysical poets in, in, in Dunn and Marvel and poets like that. So uh, whereas you will not find this unified sensibility in writers like Milton that he, that he points out, where so these two aspects the emotion and the intellect so uh, are disparate entities they, they they don't they don't blend properly in the works of milton so that's what you call a dissociation of sensibility whereas in, and and that is why uh, uh, let's say the new critics especially t.s Eliot, uh, took initiative in reinstating the status of uh, let's say the, the metaphysical poets once again who were largely disregarded for centuries together so he put them back on the pedestal and maybe, maybe the reason why we as students and teachers teach John Dunn in our academic syllabus is because uh, Eliot found that the metaphysical poets belong to the true tradition of, let's say, uh, the, uh, in English, poetic, English poetry. And of course, then uh, uh, there is this famous uh, expression about objective correlative where uh, uh, Eliot is trying to say how a poet is trying to evoke emotions uh, in a work of art. However, a dramatist is evoking emotions in a work of art. There must be uh, uh, there must be objects, events, sounds, ideas, uh, phrases, words. So these actually evoke emotions. Uh, and how do I explain? Maybe. If, if I am not robbing too much of your time, uh, let's uh, let's take an, a, a, a story or, or a drama or a, or, a, or a film in which uh, there is this young little girl whose father bought her uh, a, a puppy, let's say a Siberian puppy when she was young, and uh, and. And that puppy always runs about her, even when her father is not there, the, the puppy is there. The puppy always reminds her of, uh, let's say, the father, the father's affection and things like that. Long after, so maybe after some time, maybe the father goes to the war, maybe he dies there. But uh, maybe after some time, you, you will find uh, that maybe the girl, maybe uh, now she's in her teens, maybe in her early uh, uh, youth, 
she is uh, going to get married and you will find the dog beside her when she walks the aisle to get married and you find maybe that there's a kind of emotion that comes it's not merely seeing a dog it is there are a, a set of emotions of, uh, that, that are associated with that particular object which is called maybe that, that animal out there so you you could you could find that that is the objective correlative uh, of the emotion which the poet is trying to or or the or the dramatist or the scenarist is is trying to to evoke without saying a single thing without making any kind of statement the very presence of that certain kind of uh, let's say objects uh, uh, ideas emotions words gives the so uh, uh, eliot says that uh, uh, in his criticism of hamlet he makes a very poignant uh, kind of uh, 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 leveling a kind of charge against shakespeare that in hamlet you don't find that objective correlative especially about uh, uh, about many of the behavior of uh, of hamlet as an individual the poet fails in that particular way to uh, to bring in emotions uh, uh, to, to bring in images and the objects or words or, or, or uh, you know in order to evoke that kind of an emotion it's mostly intellectual uh, so anyway uh, so uh, these are the kind of things that you, you know, come across uh, uh, as eliot's contribution to literature now let me come back to uh, my topic, uh, as I have already said, Eliot had its influence. I had his influence on new criticism, new, criti new critical thinking. However, not all of Eliot, but some ideas of Eliot had a tremendous influence in the making of or in the formation of the new critical school. Now, the other major uh, literary critics of the, uh, on, the, on the British side are I.R. Richards, William Empson, F.R. Lewis, L.C. Knights, Dred Derek Traversy, etc. Of, of this, of course, uh, I.R. Richards and William Empson and F.R. Lewis are more prominent, and the first two are certainly more important than, uh, than the others. Okay, now, uh, I.R. Richards, uh, of course, uh, again, uh, uh, very much a contemporary of uh, T.S. Eliot. Uh, he was a professor of Cambridge, and by around 1920s, he, he conducted an experiment University of Cambridge to the undergraduate students. So the uh, the experiment was that he gave a set of poems to his students. The poems were uh, the, the the names of the poets. The authors were not given along with. No additional information was provided, and the students were asked to focus on the words on the page, the text as such, and try to interpret and evaluate uh, without the help of let us say any external uh, extrinsic uh, let's say information so this is uh, known as the cambridge experiment by richards and the result was rather surprising they came up with uh, very let's say valid uh, insights into poetry many of the students actually uh, rated some certain poems which are uh, written by un, uh, relatively obscure poets, much uh, greater than uh, accomplished poets. So if they were given the names along with maybe the, the obscure poets, poetry would have been discarded, saying that these are important because they will be influenced by, let's say, the, the, the received notions or, or, or the preconceived uh, prejudicial uh, kind of judgments that were already available. So. Cutting about all the cutting out all such things, uh, uh, Richards made them look into this particular uh, uh, piece on the page rather objectively. Now this is, uh, and what he uh, was asking them is to make what you call the close reading. So this is almost the watchword of I.R. Richards' practice, which we call practical criticism. He has written a book by name, uh, Practical Criticism. Uh, which was written in 1924. So, practical criticism, a study of literary judgment. Okay, so this close reading, uh, 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 reading, uh, reading the words on the page and nothing else. Okay, so uh, without depending on preconceived or accepted notions about the text. And again, this is purely objective method, and this this method revolutionized the the teaching and study of English literature because from then onwards, let's say. Uh, uh, English criticism uh, began to focus on the text. Again, leaving aside all the other, uh, let's, let's say, extraneous material, 
He advocated the evaluation of the text solely on intrinsic merit and not on biographical details and sociopolitical influences. Of course, we have already mentioned this. I don't want to elaborate on these ideas. Anyway, Richards um, had uh, written or authored three significant books. One book is uh, authored uh, along with another major uh, theoretician in Oxford at that time by C.K. Ogden. Uh, and, and the name of the book is uh, Meaning of Meaning. So we quite often use the word meaning. What is the meaning of the word? What is the meaning of the poem, etc.? But what do you mean by meaning? What's the meaning of the word meaning? What do you mean when you mean something? So uh, uh, that particular question is being uh, uh, dwelt in detail, uh, may, may, maybe in the, in the text. So uh, there is uh, this meaning of meaning, and, and there is principles of literary criticism and practical criticism. And, and let us uh, uh, think about some of the major ideas which uh, I.R. Richards is trying to, uh, to propagate uh, through his writing and critical practices. OK. The, the, Maybe uh, it, it, uh, this is one one major contribution is about the four kinds of meaning. So uh, as I have already said, when you say meaning, what do you mean? When you when when you when, when you make a line, when, when you when you read the, the, the one line in a poem and say, what is the meaning of this? What exactly do you want from it? Or how do you find the meaning of something? Where do you look for the meaning? And now uh, Richard says that there are uh, so, uh, several kinds of meaning or several ways in which meaning can be generated. Of course, uh, when you study language, the semantics speaks about the, uh, the, the meaning of words, but not exactly. What, what I, Richard says, that, for example, uh, the four kinds of meaning is one uh, sense, feeling, tone, intention. So these are key words which... Uh, 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 which I.R. Richards uses. And what, do you, what does he mean by sense? The sense is that which is communicated by the plain literal meaning, the lexical meaning So uh, uh, of a word. A word in isolation will mean something. That, that's a, that, that isolated word, or, uh, the meaning, is what you find maybe in, in a dictionary. There is a lexical meaning. It's a literal plain meaning of the word. So that is what, that is what, it, uh, what it communicates. When that word is, uh, let, let's say, spoken or written uh, or read on, on a page. Secondly, feeling. Feeling is part of the emotion, part of the meaning of a text. So this is this is a very significant point. Feeling is the meaning because the new critics consider the work of art as as, as an organic entity in itself. And the purpose of, uh, of writing a poem is not merely to, uh, uh, to, give, uh, uh, to explain an idea. It also aims to, let's say, to evoke certain kinds of feelings. And therefore, feeling which a poem evokes in the, in the reader, be it whatever be, it is part of the meaning of, the, of, 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 a, of a work of art. Okay, And so the feeling is a meaning. And then the tonality. The, the tone, uh, which the, uh, the tone refers to the attitude of the writer to the reader. When you read a poem, you, you know that uh, it, 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 uh, there's a there, there's a certain way in which, let's say, the the, uh, the poet is trying to communicate with uh, 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 with his reader. Uh, take for example a, a poem like uh, "Stopping with the Woods on a Snowy Evening." Whose woods these are? I think I know. He lives in the village, though. So look at the opening. So who is speaking, and what kind of attitude does he have towards the uh, the presumed uh, uh, listener? It's, it's just a very casual. Maybe a farmer talking to another farmer. Maybe a, a farmer just wondering whose boots these are, and then telling to him that I, I I think I know him. So that that kind of self rumination, that, that kind of a tone is there. But is it the same tone that you will find when you read Milton of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree? So uh, that, that's not how it sounds. It's, it's entirely different. So, or Wordsworth says, there was a time when the meadow, the stream, the grove, and every common site was filled with the celestial light and, and things like that, in dimensions of immortality. You, you don't find uh, 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 the same kind of tone everywhere. 
So that 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 kind of the relationship uh, which the poem try to establish with the reader, that is part of the meaning as far as uh, I. Richards is concerned. That's why he's considered tone as a as a meaning is is one kind of meaning, and then the intention. Of course, in, in new critical practice, the word intention is confusing because you you get to hear another expression called the intentional fallacy, but. Uh, that idea of intentional fallacy had been um, put forth by uh, Beer, uh, Wimsett and Beardsley, which we will discuss later. But uh, Ayur Richards uses the word intention <laughs> uh, in, a, in a slightly uh, a different sense altogether. So uh, this is the effect which one intends to produce uh, and, and which modifies the expression which, uh, which a poet writes. And of course, I, I think uh, I am overshooting my time limit, and I, I will make a quick run uh, through my uh, through the rest of my uh, presentation. And of course, uh, Ayur Richard speaks about uh, two uses of language. Again, he says that there are two uses of language. One is the uh, scientific use of language. In a scientific use of language, um, uh, language is used as referential. When you when you say that there are two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom in a molecule of water, you you mean just what you say, isn't it? You, you don't. Mean, there are no subtleties there. You can so what what you say is uh, referential and verifiable uh, against uh, let's say uh, objective reality, verifiable as true or false. So that is that is the kind of language that you use in science, in in mathematics. So say uh, in physics or chemistry, so this, the scientific uh, ob objective use of language, that is one kind of use. Whereas in art, you don't use the same kind of language. The very purpose of using language in, in, a, in a work of art is different. And, and he, use, he calls it the emotive use of language, where words are used to evoke emotions. So, uh, so my, my heart aches. If you say that particular word, or a sentence uh, to a cardiologist, uh, he would he would understand uh, something. Whereas when Keats say, "My heart aches and a drowsy numbness paints my sense as though of him like I had drunk," it, it's not what, uh, what 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 scientifically means. It, it it is evoking certain kinds of feelings. Keats is uh, autumn nightingale is meant to evoke emotions and not. Uh, to make references to maybe a, a scientific objective reality. And of course, uh, and another idea that he talks about is the figurative language, where in poetry, you are using not norm, uh, uh, not only emotive use of language, but figurative uses of language. Language is used in figures, where let's say you use symbols and images and metaphors and similes, where so one plus one is not two, but more than that. So when, when two things are put together, you, you, you will find a, a, a plurality of meaning. It generates more meaning than that, that really is there. So uh, that's the peculiarity of the figurative use of language. Now, another major uh, pro, uh, critic of the, uh, of, of the period uh, of, the, of the new critical movement is William Empson. And Empson was uh, the disciple of Ayer Richards. Uh, maybe a, a prominent disciple and a very favorite disciple, and uh, you will find uh, 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 Emerson writing a book about uh, the intricacies uh, in reading poetry, about the, about many kind of problems by, that an ordinary person might come across. So, for example, uh, ambiguity. When you write a scientific article, and uh, if your expression is ambiguous, uh, the scientific article is considered to be logically erroneous because you are not communicating what you are trying to say. The logical, uh, the logic fails because you, you, you don't communicate because you, your, your expressions might mean two things at the same, or two or more things. In a referential world, in a scientific use of language, one thing should refer to one thing. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence. Whereas in, 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 the, in literature, what you find is ambiguous, ambiguity, which can be roughly what you call uh, lack of clarity. But uh, uh, Emerson speaks about seven types of ambiguity, and, and I, don't, I, I don't have time. But I, I have just listed down the first type of ambiguity is a metaphor. So where uh, that, that is, two things are said to be uh, alike, uh, which have different properties. 
then again, uh, two or more meanings are resolved into one. Two ideas that are connected through tech context can be given in one word simultaneously. Of course, uh, we have uh, all what you have to know is that there are seven types of ambiguity that he speaks about. And then, of course, on on the uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, you have uh, a, a set of uh, critics, John Crow Ransom. Of course, uh, you know, he's a major critic. Uh, he criticizes uh, uh, his arguments. He's, again, uh, he was a teacher. Um, a, a, and a philosopher. So he criticizes the new humanism and Marxism, which were tools for analyzing literature, analyzing works of art at that time. And he says that, uh, say, the, the details of uh, new humanist ideas and Marxist principles in the analysis of literature are misleading to the readers because they are focusing on extra textual material, extra textual material, which is not necessary at all in understanding a work of art. So as we have already said, they focus on the text. So the other major figures are Alan Tate, R.P. Blackmore, Kenneth Burke, Ivor Winters, Clayant Brooks, Robert Penn Warren, Win William Win uh, Wimsett and Munro Beardsley. Of course, among these, you, you find uh, Clayant Brooks, Robert Ben Warren, Wimsett and Beardsley are more prominent than the rest. I'm not, I'm not underestimating any one of them, but saying, uh, of course, uh, you know, Alan Tate was one of the intellectual giants of the time. I, I'm not, in, in, I'm in no way underestimating his caliber, but I am saying that as far as uh, uh, literary students, uh, uh, students of literature are concerned, uh, uh, Clayant Brooks holds more water because he has written uh, uh, books uh, that influences our critical understanding. Now, uh, look at uh, Clayant Brooks' contribution, Critical Works, The Well Wrought Urn. Of course, the, the title reminds you of Keats's urn, right? Okay, The Well Wrought Urn, Studies in the Structure of Poetry. And again, Language of Paradox. Again, so uh, just like Empson uses the word, uh, uh, let's say, ambiguity, uh, Brooks uses the word paradox. And that is to say, it does not lend one single meaning. Sometimes certain kinds of ideas that are used in the poem may run contrary to each other. So, uh, and this this contradiction, this paradoxical paradoxes, uh, does not undermine the meaning of a poem, but rather enriches it. That's what he is trying to say. Take, for example, uh, some of the simple things. For uh, everyone uh, has heard about this poem, "A Road Not Taken," by. Uh, I hope Robert Frost. Okay. Well, whenever you speak about the road not taken, uh, what do you explain? You normally explain about the road taken because uh, at the end of the poem, the poem says that uh, I took the one that was less traveled by and that has made all the difference. And whenever people appreciate the work of art, of course, oh yeah, that's, that's a great statement to say that you, you take the, the, uh, the, the not so beaten path. You, you take the less beaten path. Not, and uh, so he says, I took the one that was less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Shouldn't the poet be titling his poem as a road taken? And why is he titling it as the road not taken? He says something more than what you actually, that meets the eye. He says something paradoxical about the very title of the poem, because the poem basically deals with the road taken, and the poem is titled as road not taken. But uh, is, is that a problem with the text? Or is that an enrichment? Because we will have to search for something more. Now, I don't, I don't have time to, uh, to elaborate on that. But of course, the other, uh, uh, he has uh, Robert Penn Warren and, and, and Claire Brooks together had penned three important literary uh, works of literature. One is Understanding Poetry in 1938, Understanding Fiction in 1943, and Understanding Drama in 1945. Now, Wimsett and Beardsley, uh, I, I, I told you that he, uh, they are important writers. And now, uh, together, they have written a book by the Verbal Icon, Studies in the Meaning of Poetry. And in the book, they have come up with Three major ideas, and I have mentioned, I failed to mention one. One is intentional fallacy, and the other is affective fallacy, and the third one is the heresy of paraphrase. <clears throat> okay, of course, you know, intentional fallacy is. So, very often, uh, whenever people talk about the meaning of a particular poem, you begin, to, you tend to think uh, that this is what the author intended. So, if you're focusing on the words on the page, if you're focusing merely on the text, what is written there, 
no matter what the author meant or what or author said or author mentioned or all other uh, specifically and categorically explained we don't have to do that the intention of the author need not necessarily be the me uh, meaning of the poem milton for instance milton's intention in paradise lost was uh, to, uh, to justify the words of, i mean justify the paths of god isn't it the ways of god to man as he says but that is his professed intention but it, it is there in the text as well but does it mean uh, is is it uh, is it enough to say maybe a, a, a reading of the text or a close reading of the text can give other uh, uh, let's say interpretation so for example um, uh, critics like um, Rob, Rob William Blake has made a mention that uh, that if you read the book closely of course he was not a, a new critic but uh, blake's uh, interpretation of faraday's loss is that that milton was in in the devil's party without knowing it that he was not that they in in spite of his professed intention of um, uh, justifying the ways of god to man he 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 was justifying the ways of the devil of, of satan and doing it doing a good job of it anyway of any anyway what we are trying to say is that uh, according to beardsley and wimsett the intention of the author is not to not to be taken into consideration if you think or in the argument that it has to be taken that the uh, the intention has to be taken into consideration for analysis is an erroneous one and that's why he calls it a fallacy it's an intentional fallacy because it is an it's an erroneous uh, wrong uh, idea uh, that uh, intention of the author has to be taken into consideration now another one is the reader after reading a particular poem oh it was so good it was so wonderful i i, I was brought to tears and i i was so excited so such kind of judgments well, you, you can't speak about the merit of a poem just because you liked it just because you were brought to tears just because you were excited that is not your personal impression you the, the way that you, uh, in which an individual reader was personally affected or influenced by a particular work of art does not uh, mean that the work of art is great or, or that is not the measure of the the greatness of work work of art okay and that is what affective fallacy speaks about and the third uh, point which i have not mentioned here is uh, is called the heresy of paraphrase so uh, as we have already said poetry makes use of uh, figurative use of language it uses uh, ambiguities which enhances the the quality of the work of art and therefore uh, we uh, we can say that you can't paraphrase it for po poem if you paraphrase a poem you will get only what the content you will get only some ideas the richness or the aesthetic qualities will be missed out if you paraphrase and that is uh, and therefore it, it is a it, it's a, a a practice which is unacceptable and unholy that's why he calls it the the the, the heresy of paraphrase okay i, I think uh, uh, i will uh, stop for the day uh, so, so, uh, 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 I have uh, maybe uh, uh, what I what I could uh, say is that uh, maybe uh, before I uh, sum up, I would like to uh, say the, the the basic ideas that I have been talking about so far. So one is uh, the literary work is a timeless, autonomous, and verbal object. That is what uh, that is one of the basic premises the new critics in general uh, agree upon. They feel that the, the meaning of a text is objective, uh, and uh, it is uh, the complex meaning cannot be explained just by paraphrasing it, as I have just said. So the meaning of a text cannot be paraphrased or brought into another another way because it is uh, uh, as it is. You remember Archibald Archibald MacLeish's poem, which ends with the line, uh, "A poem does not uh, does not mean but be. A poem has to." does not has to be to mean but it must be so it is an entity in itself so uh, it, 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 it is it is an organic unity so it has to be addressed uh, as such it does not have any, it does not need the support of external extrinsic details to support itself the nature of literary language is different from the scientific language as we have already said and again uh, 
Now, the form of a literary language is inseparable from its content. Again, so this is an idea which had been borrowed from the formalist. It is the form is inseparable. The form is actually uh, the art itself. And again, <clears throat> So what, what a text means and how it means, what a text says and the way it says it are actually one and the same. It's the same thing. You, you can't uh, uh, say it in, in a different, if you say it in a different way, in a different format, actually it becomes a different work of art and not the, not the same thing. And again, so the work has to be ideal, organic, unity in which elements contribute to the create an indivisible whole. And again, uh, maybe is uh, new criticism uh, un uh, uncontested? Was the, were they accepted uh, totally and completely by everyone? Not really. Not, uh, new criticism is actually uh, in, in pedagogical practice, in, in, in classroom teaching, maybe the practices are still going on in many universities, but still as a uh, as critical practice, uh, it is not being recommended uh, as it used to be, maybe a few decades ago. So uh, critics like Rene Velak uh, say that uh, the problem with new criticism is that they, they they show, or the new critical practice does not show any kind of concern uh, towards the function of literature. So this is uh, Velak's, uh, so the, uh, the function of literature, uh, maybe in the uh, uh, just like the arts for art's sake, uh, aesthetic movement, people say that it does not have a function outside it. Maybe. Uh, but we know that, or, or the, it is generally agreed upon that the function of uh, or, or, of art uh, does not end in itself. So Velak is a person who subscribed to such a view, and therefore he says that uh, now they, they don't take the social function of art. And again, uh, uh, the Chicago uh, critics uh, consider that the new critics were basically a reactionary and obscurist uh, set of people. They are, uh, in, instead of taking, so maybe just like the title of the uh, speech, which says the growth and development. So uh, the new critics were not taking literary critical practices forward, but rather they were taking it backward. That is what the Chicago uh, the critics uh, 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 charge uh, these people. And again, the Geneva School of Structuralists and the Russian formalists, they attack the new criticism, saying that the methodology uh, followed by the new critics is so sterile and often boring and routine and stereotyped, uh, which is to some extent true. Because if you look at the critical practices or, 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 or by many of the critics, you will find that they are almost uh, written in a very stereotypical way. So, and again, uh, some uh, new critics followed certain kinds of rigid religious rules as well. Of course, uh, T.S. Eliot for one. Uh, if I leave is for another, they were all religiously motivated people and they brought the religious faith and religious ideas into their criticism and uh, say uh, many of the you know, structuralists and formalists do not subscribe to this idea of incorporating religious notions and, uh, and, uh, and articles of faith into the understanding and analysis and, and judgment of poetry. So uh, another major charge against the new critics is that the new critics underemphasize the reader. And uh, and they underemphasize the poet, the two two entities. So uh, and, and therefore, uh, as a result of that, we have new kind of uh, literary theories coming up. Maybe as it, it's against the reaction of new critical practice that we have uh, reader response theory. Okay, uh, it came up as a, uh, 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 as a counter movement against this. So uh, and again the. The banishment of the reader. So the, the reader has almost been banished from the site as far as, uh, let's say, the new critics were concerned because they were trying to focus on the page and try to arrive at a true and correct interpretation. So that is what they were trying to do. They were not, uh, uh, let's say, accommodative to the idea that there can be uh, as many readings for the text as there are readers. So, but these kinds of ideas, of course, we know that from the from here onwards, maybe from the 1950s, uh, you you have uh, 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 literary theory coming into being. So, more literary theory, theoretical practices. We have Marxist criticism, feminist criticism. We have uh, cultural uh, uh, studies. Also, uh, several kinds of uh, theories are coming up, and uh, you have to see the theories maybe in contrast with uh, Ayer Richards practice, which was what he called practical criticism. 
the practical criticism actually gave way to theoretical criticism. Okay, that is what the emergence of new theories and maybe uh, that will be taken up by some other teacher, maybe in the coming days. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patient listening. Hope you have merited, uh, enjoyed to some extent and let's say uh, profited at least to some measure. Thank you very much for your patient listening.